I would like to put a trigger warning. If you've been suffering with eating disorder, self-harm or suicidal thoughts, this video might not be for you. I have plenty of other, lighter, happier videos you can go and watch instead. I'm not going to mention specific details or any numerical information, but the topics I'm going to bring up may be sensitive to some of you. I'd first like to make it very clear that you do not need to be hospitalised or inpatient for your eating disorder to be valid. Your eating disorder is just as valid, just as real and just as severe in, as anyone else's. All eating disorders are serious and all eating disorder sufferers deserve help. I was actually taken to hospital initially for other mental health reasons, not my eating disorder specifically. This was the first time I'd actually been admitted to hospital for my mental illnesses and it was only for five days. I also want to say now, just so you know, that I'm doing really well. I'm back home, safe, still smiling, still fighting, and working towards an eating disorder free future. Now, this is a very long awaited video and it has been very highly requested. It has taken me this long to actually sit down and film it because I really wanted to think about what I was going to say before I jumped straight into it. Obviously it was a very traumatic experience for me and I don't want this video to have that effect on any of you. But now I've had time to reflect on the whole experience and I've managed to get my recovery and balancing my mental health back on track. Like I said, I wasn't actually admitted to the hospital for my eating disorder specifically. The crisis that I got into, it was caused by my eating disorder, but I wasn't admitted for like specific medical problems that were caused by my eating disorder directly, if that makes sense. Just to give you a bit of context, as well as my anorexia, I also suffer from depression and self-harm. My eating disorder was actually triggered as like a trauma response and it became sort of a coping mechanism for me after months spent in an emotionally abusive relationship which I don't really feel comfortable going into any details about yet. Although I had obviously fully committed to recovery when I went all in, we hadn't really dealt with the cause of my eating disorder. I hadn't opened up about the trauma that I'd experienced to anyone at all. So although I was trying really hard to recover and although I was really kind of fighting to get better, the um, causes of the eating disorder weren't really sorting themselves out. So I kind of went from one coping mechanism, which was the eating disorder, to being quite heavily reliant on another one, which was self-harming. And my mum did know about this and she was really obviously wanting me to stop because you can't live the rest of your life relying on a coping mechanism that harms you in that way but I kind of knew that I wasn't just going to be able to stop because it was just getting so overwhelming in the days leading up to my hospital admission I was just getting really low I was feeling kind of hopeless because the eating disorder was getting so so loud and although I was still from the outside looking like I was doing really well with recovery I was you know, still eating everything, still challenging the eating disorder and all my fear foods. Inside I could just feel it getting so loud again and it was really overwhelming. And I just didn't feel like I could continue like that. It felt like something needed to give. I didn't really see any way out because what had seemed to happen is every time I got quite far along with my recovery journey, the eating disorder would just get really loud again and I didn't see a way that I could kind of fully recover or make it out. And obviously because I hadn't opened up to anyone about what had actually caused my eating disorder, no one else could really help me. So I was feeling quite lost. It got to the point where um, on Friday night I tried to take my own life, which as you can see wasn't successful because I'm still here and I am very grateful that I am. If you have felt suicidal in the past or are feeling like that now, please just know that it does get better and life is worth living and life is worth holding on to. Please don't lose hope, there is help out there for you and it is possible for you to get better. You don't deserve to feel like this and you won't feel like this forever. So please, please don't act on those feelings. Try and reach out for help. I love you and I'm thinking of you and you'll get through this. So I was then taken to A&E by my parents to get like the medical side of that sorted out and kind of like stabilise me. I was then moved onto a ward in the early hours of Saturday morning and that was kind of where the eating disorder really took hold because being in the hospital environment they were obviously keeping me very safe, so it meant that my coping mechanism of self-harming wasn't there, if that makes sense. And at that time, I wasn't grateful that I was still here because I still felt hopeless. I still hadn't opened up to anyone. I still really didn't see a way out of it all. So the eating disorder really took hold then. And I spent the next few days in hospital just kind of 
dying, really. <clears throat> I wasn't on like a specialised eating disorder ward, so none of the nurses or doctors really understood what to do. They just kind of kept checking in, kept asking me to eat and drink, and then at times where I was kind of getting medically unstable, they'd um, put a, like a little like drip in my arm and I was kind of like given my um, fluids and like my energy like with the glucose and everything like that through my arm which is the same idea as a nasal gastric tube it's like a cannula I think it's called and that had already been put in on Friday night while I was in A&E so they just decided to use that for like all the fluids and everything that I needed it wasn't a very pleasant experience to be honest it was horrible and I'm very grateful to be out of there now cams couldn't come and see me straight away which was kind of infuriating because obviously I wasn't in a good place and all I needed was someone to talk to who could try and understand when the nurses couldn't I don't think I saw cams until months Monday. So that is a long time to wait. I had to wait days and days and then it wasn't even my own CAMS team, it was just the crisis team that had come round. My actual CAMS worker wasn't available to see me for like a week or so after the whole event, which to be honest it's kind of shocking. I know it's not her fault but it just shows how underfunded the whole system is. How ill do you actually have to be to get help? I wasn't able at that point to be alive on my own if that makes sense without everything that I was like hooked up to I wouldn't still be here and yet there was still no help available for me other than them keeping me like alive but just alive. By Monday I still wasn't doing well at all with my eating and drinking but I just decided to totally open up to the crisis team that I saw because I just thought it's worth a shot you know. I felt so hopeless and I was like if anyone can help me it will be worth it and yeah, that was the first time that I actually kind of, well, I just sort of mentioned the fact that I'd been in a relationship that had been quite toxic, I think I described it as, and I sort of described it and how it left me feeling and basically everything like that. And that was the first time that I was really told that that relationship was actually abusive and that was the first time that someone told me that what happened and it wasn't my fault and that it wasn't me so that was a relief to hear i still struggled to believe it if that makes sense i still struggled to believe that it was actually a form of abuse that i was experiencing and i still struggled to believe that it wasn't my fault yeah it was good for someone else to kind of acknowledge that that was probably the cause of the eating disorder and that I didn't really need much help with body image because I'd done work with that with cams. My body image is absolutely fine but there was just some sort of like block that was stopping me from recovering and that was it. So after we talked to the cams team I worked with them and my mum and with the hospital and like my other cams team and we all kind of worked together to to put together a plan that would mean that it was safe for me to come home. I didn't really engage with that on the first day that we were doing it and they came back the next day and I think it was in the early hours of Tuesday morning that I managed to have my very first drink and then later my very first bite to eat and that was probably the hardest thing I've ever done. It's crazy how quickly and how much the eating disorder can take hold of you again Especially when like I'm in a place in my recovery where like I'm doing really well, I'm challenging it on my own, I can go out to eat, all of these things and so quickly it can take hold again to such an extent. It also just shows how quickly that you can come back from that. Since coming out of hospital I have eaten every single meal, every single snack. I think that just shows that it is possible to come back from that really low point and I also want to say it's worth coming back from that really low point however hopeless you might feel, however unmotivated. It's worth fighting because there is a life that is worth living out there for you that you can achieve and it is possible to feel happy and it is possible to feel free and it is possible to recover and properly recover and recover so you don't get any eating disorder thoughts and recover so you never go back to it. After I was able to eat my food myself, I think my mindset kind of changed as in I felt like there was a bit of hope again because for the first time people were actually kind of promising me help and they were promising that things could get properly better and now they understood what was going on. I was really trying to believe that. So when the crisis cams team came back on the Tuesday, we actually made a proper plan and I was discharged late that evening. 
one of the things that we did as part of my safety plan was making a safety box which i will show you so a safety box is basically a box of things to make you feel safe when you're maybe feeling really anxious or the eating sort of voice is really loud or you're feeling really down or you have thoughts of self-harming or of suicide this is like almost a safe space that you can come to and just remind yourself why you're fighting and distract yourself and comfort yourself and i found that it has been a really good distraction i have this card from my little cousin that she made me when i was um really ill in october i think it was and it's the sweetest thing just have a look at that I have like all my favourite photos that just remind me of everything that's like worth sticking around for. I have this piece of pampas grass and it's really nice to just kind of like fiddle with and it keeps your hands busy and it feels really nice against your skin so that's really nice. It's like a sensory kind of item. Um, another sensory sort of item is this candle. And it smells just like my girlfriend's hair, so it's like a really comforting smell. Another thing I have is a crisp packet. These are my favourite crisps and we only ever get them when we're on the beach in um, Morpha in Wales where we go on holiday every year. And so that just really brings me back to being there and it's definitely my happy place and a place where I feel really safe. I have a crystal. This is rose quartz. Um, so it's for love and self-love and so yeah that's really nice i have a coloring book because that's a really good distraction i have my favorite like affirmation type cards i am actually planning on kind of creating my own affirmation cards Shh, don't tell anyone so that's really exciting i'm gonna let you know the details of that very soon this is like one of my favorite books and it's super easy to read so it's really easy to kind of get into and distract yourself with this is like I don't know, it's just the cutest little bowl ever. Look at it. So cool. This is a letter that my girlfriend wrote for me a little while ago. So that's really nice to read back. This is an anxiety journal. So it's got like different activities that you can do and like motivational quotes. And so that is really nice as well. And yeah, that is everything in my safety box it's taken me a little while to build it up and it's something that you can kind of like add different things to and to be honest i think that everyone should have a safety box whether or not you struggle with your mental health i think it's really important to have like a box of all your special things that can calm you down because we all have times where we're feeling sad or anxious or just need a distraction i think that the main thing i've realized from this whole experience is that i'm stronger than i think i am that i can get through difficult times and that i can come back from difficult times and that difficult times aren't the end of the road they're a part of the journey in recovery slip ups are to be expected and setbacks but setbacks don't mean that you're then on a trajectory trajectory downwards you can come back from that and you can come even further forwards i am a firm believer that everything happens for a reason i know that this is quite like a controversial belief if you don't believe that that's perfectly fine we're entitled to our own opinions on things i think that there was a reason why it got to the point where i had no choice but to be hospitalized because it finally put me in a situation where i felt like i could open up about what happened and that has then meant that hopefully soon i'm going to have access to help that i actually need and have needed for a long time but i haven't realized i needed and others haven't realized i needed while we we're in the hospital also my mum actually sat down with i think about six different nurses and doctors and explain to them about eating disorders and what they can actually do to help the things that they maybe didn't do that were helpful and so i think it's really amazing that my mum kind of had the courage to speak up about that because if it helps even one other person who gets admitted to that ward one other person that comes to that hospital with the same crisis that i was having then that's worth it isn't it if you're really struggling with your mental health at the moment just know that you can get through it and that it is possible to come out the other side of and in the long run it might make you a stronger person i've just been editing this video and there are a couple of things that i would like to add firstly if you have been 
affected by any of the topics that I've brought up in this video, I have linked some helpful websites and numbers down below that you definitely need to check out because there is help out there available for you. Also, I am still struggling with my mental health. Unfortunately, CAMS is very underfunded, so I don't have access to any of the treatment I need through CAMS yet, and I won't for the foreseeable future. I've always felt kind of like the um, diagnosis of depression didn't really fit with how I felt and like how I am, and I do match pretty much every single symptom of BPD, but that's not something that CAMS tend to diagnose to under 18s because I think your personality is still developing or something like that. So there's not much point speculating on that, but my CAMS worker does talk a lot about me struggling with like emotional regulation and hopefully I'm going to start a group through CAMS that should help me a bit with that. I think that all I can really do is do my very best to stay safe for the next three years until I do turn 18 and the help is out there available for me which unfortunately it isn't at the moment. This video was quite scary to make. It's not easy like being this vulnerable on the internet and putting yourself out there for other people's scrutiny. Now that like my platforms are getting quite big, it's scary knowing that other people kind of judging everything that you do and they have their own opinion on what you do and they have something to say about what you do. It's sometimes hard to be like totally honest and transparent knowing that you're going to get a backlash from it and also obviously I am in a community, like an online community of other very vulnerable people so I don't want to be totally honest and then risk triggering others so just know that I am really trying my best to get better and I'm doing everything that I can to sort of aid my mental health and stay safe and my recovery is still going really well but I just want you guys to be patient with me and know that my mood is all over the place but that I am going to be okay and that I am doing what I can. Don't think that because I'm feeling really low one day or one hour even it's going to stay like that because it won't and I can go from feeling really low and like it's the end of the world to feeling on top of the world and feeling absolutely amazing so I don't know I guess there's kind of like a warning that I might seem a bit crazy. <laughs> I just want to say thank you so much for watching this video. It really means a lot to me, all of your support. I love you all loads and hopefully we can move towards some brighter, happier videos. I don't really want to be making another video like this anytime soon to be honest. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.